Hello and welcome to Matters of Faith. I'm Christiana Bakker. Our topic today, Islam, a rational faith. Many people think religions are irrational. They are opium for the masses, and people adhere to religion with blind faith, but without reason. Today, we're going to shed some light on these common prejudices. We look at the primary sources of Islam, the Quran, and the Sunnah, the practice of the Prophet, and we look into the history of Islam to understand the roles of reason, debate, and knowledge. Our guest today is the very distinguished Dr. Murad Hoffmann, a famous former diplomat and ambassador for Germany, and author of many prominent books on various different aspects of Islam. For example, Islam the Alternative and Islam 2000. Welcome, Dr. Hoffmann. Glad to be here. Um, first of all, could you define the terms rationality, reason, and faith? A Muslim cannot get away without faith. Yes. Uh, once you have pronounced the Shahada and you understand what it means, then you can apply your rationality and your reasoning again to the two things which we can use as object of study. One is nature, the cosmos, and you can find God there. And the other is the Quran, the word of God. Yes, which asks us again and again to use our reasoning. Right. The, uh, there are 15 places in the Quran where an appeal is made to think, yes. to reflect, to use one's mind. And therefore, uh, I maintain that of the religions I know, Islam is the most rational. Mm -hmm. So you would say definitely Islam is a religion for people who think. Indeed. What about blind faith? Is there such a thing as blind faith in Islam? Um, if you believe without reflecting on why you believe, then your faith might be blind. But I wouldn't belittle such a faith. Because the end result is that somebody who studied philosophy and somebody who is uh, a simple-minded uh, citizen, the two are in the same boat as far as transcendence is concerned. They do not have access without faith. Yes. Now, Islam means submission or devotion to God. How can this submission again, you know, be, be married to the rationality, reasoning. When you know that you are 100% dependent on somebody else, it is not irrational for you to try to have good relations <laughs> with such a person. You will make gifts at Christmas time or other times to such a person. And it is absolutely rational that we should devote some time each day to, communica to communicate with that person <laughs> that for you is all essential. Yes. <clears throat> yes. Now, could you give us some examples from the Islamic tradition where reason and faith uh, is being you know, married or goes together? I think it begins with the lifetime of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam already when he lived in a bi religious community that is in Al Madina. And he dictated a constitution which became the first written constitution of the world for a situation which demanded ration rationality to the extreme to make two people who had two different religious, r religions live together peacefully. That was an extremely rational thing. Yeah. <coughs> And the very first one, obviously. Now, within the Islamic tradition, um, one source is reasoning. 
um, uh, and jurisprudence, jurisprudence and uh, the ap application of the principles, uh, fiqh and usul fiqh. Um, could you explain this a little bit as well? Um, How scholars have always used reason. Yes. I think the Hadith critique, which had to develop very early, uh, and which reached its peak already in the 8th century, and the Mutasila philosophers, also 8th and 9th century, give great credit to the openness of Islam to, to reasoning. Um, the Muslims themselves applied their critical abilities to judging whether a tradition of the Prophet could be or could not be correct. I mean, to deal with something as holy <laughs> as the uh, Hadith literature with rational critique I think is extraordinary in human, in terms of human history. Yeah, um, hadith literature means the. Could you explain uh, this? Um, the collections of the sayings of the Prophet, uh, like Al Bukhari or Muslim or uh, Abu Dawood and, and, and the others. Yeah, his sayings were collected in yes. by many by different authors, and there's yes. a whole science behind it, even yes. for a saying to be valid um, and yes. acceptable. The yes. chain of transmission has to be exactly. correct and, and uh, so many conditions have to be met. Yes. Now, um, the scholars uh, in the Islamic uh, history also uh, formulated several different schools of law. Um, Indeed. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? I think we should first of all distinguish between what is called Sharia and Fiqh. Mm -hmm. We should talk about Sharia only when we deal with norms contained in the text of the Quran. Mm -hmm. And anything developing from there in terms of legal systems, that we should call fiqh. And we should not forget that that fiqh is man-made, mm -hmm. is human. Mm -hmm and therefore is not eternal. And the early Muslims developed four different accepted, there were more, yes. but <coughs> Islamic history was more or less uh, coined by being exposed to four schools of law. They differed from each other in some cases amazingly much. Uh, some considered something legal that others considered worthy of death penalty <laughs> to, to such an extent, incredible. Yeah. But the Muslims were so conscious that law is a human product from divine sources, human product from divine sources, yes. that differences should be maintained should be honored. So within the precinct of the Haram in Mecca, mm -hmm. the four schools had their own teachers who simultaneously taught their versions of the law. This is near the Kaaba. Yeah, around the Kaaba. Near the house of God, for yeah. anybody who may yeah. not understand yes. those terms. Yes. So there was Hanafi law, mm -hmm. Shafi'i law, Hanbali law uh, taught simultaneously. Yes, extraordinary. Could you give us an example of um, where you made the differentiation between Sharia and Fiqh? Can you give us a practical example of what would be Sharia and what would be Fiqh? Human, what is yeah. perhaps not eternal, and then eternal. Um, in the fifth surah, it says somebody who kills, without any justification, a human being before God is like somebody who has killed all of mankind. Yeah. Uh,
that means that murder is an extraordinary crime and cannot be discussed away. That is the case of Sharia. Yes. And fiqh? Fiqh, um, people later on uh, developed the science of how to support a divorced <laughs> wife, for instance. Yeah. And the different schools of law came to different conclusions of how much and how one should arrive at figuring out um, the maintenance of a, d a divorced wife. This yeah. is another example. Now, going back to history, um, Muslim knowledge was a bridge between Aristotelian knowledge and Western uh, philosophy. Could you explain this contribution of the Muslims? Well, we take, for instance, uh, Ibn Rushd. Ibn Rushd was a 12th century uh, philosoph philosopher who knew Aristotle, but expanded on Aristotle, because Aristotle had no ontology, no teaching on the creation of matter. Uh, um, in contrast to Plato, Aristotle dealt with what he saw without speculating about how it came about. Mm -hmm. So there is no Aristotelian ontology. Mm -hmm. Ibn Rushd replaced that on, against the background of Islamic thinking. So that was so important. Uh, Ibn Rushd published 12 different commentaries on Aristotelian philosophy. And that Thomas Aquinas knew about Aristotle was through the translations made of Ibn Rushd's philosophy in Toledo, into Latin. So there is a direct impact of Islam on European philosophy. There are more examples, of course, of how Muslims influenced uh, European thinking in the Middle Ages. Could you tell us some more? Well, Ibn Sina is an extraordinary case, too. I Avicenna, <coughs> he was not only a philosopher, he was a medical doctor. And he was maybe the most important medical mind in human history. Mm. Because <coughs> his textbook on how to heal Kanun, it was called, yes. the law, Kanun, yes was used in Europe for 600 years, from the 12th to the 18th century. Yes, it was the foundation of medicine. Absolutely. Yeah. Or take Ibn Khaldun. Ibn Khaldun did something that nobody else achieved in world history. He created two sciences. Mm -hmm. He is the founder of scientific historiography. Mm -hmm. And he is the founder of sociology. In his world history, he developed the idea that human society moves from primitive into refined, into decadent. Mm -hmm. And then it starts anew. Yeah. Um, quite extraordinary. Um, people here don't know that and think that sociology was invented in the 19th century. It's wrong. It was invented in the 15th century wow. by Ibn Khaldun. And Ibn Khaldun was also an, an uh, um, Andalusian who moved into North Africa and taught also in Tunis mm -hmm. and in Cairo. Mm. Now, could you uh, go on to explain how Muslim thinkers even influenced the Age of Enlightenment in Europe? I mean, did the Europeans 
<coughs> pick up some of those thoughts. Which but, ones? That is a pretty sad story because Voltaire wanted to criticize the Catholic Church for its irrationality and he abused Islam for that. He wrote a, st uh, a, a drama called Muhammad in which he criticizes irrationality in religion meant to attack the Catholic Church, but the Muslims had to pay the, pay the price for it. Frederick the Great criticized Voltaire for it. Mm. He wrote him and said, you know better that Islam is not that way, because Frederick the, of the Great of Prussia, he knew about Islam since he had Islamic troops. He had several brigades of Muslims. They were formerly Russian soldiers who were caught and then were integrated into, into the Prussian army. Mm -hmm. But they were Muslims of Tatar background. Right. And he criticized Voltaire. Yeah, yes. he criticized Voltaire. Yes. Lessing did. Um, with his Nathan the Wise. Yes. In Nathan the Wise, they are Jewish, Christian, and Muslim people, but only the Muslims are without fault. Really? Are absolutely ideal. If you read it, you will, you will uh, find that out. It's quite extraordinary. <coughs> or take Goethe. Goethe ran into Islam directly when the Russian troops of Alexander the Great during the Napoleonic Wars came to Weimar and he saw Bashkiri soldiers pray in Weimar and he was impressed. Uh, so when he wrote his West Eastern uh, Divan. Divan. He did so against the background of direct visual uh, experiences he had with Muslims. Mm. Yes. And would you say it was a brave text? Because it really, and in many instances, speaks from the perspective of a Muslim. No, because the 18th century was a tolerant century. Right. And it was a century where deism grew, which meant that you left it up to people like Frederick the Great, chacun a son goût. Uh -huh. Each to their own taste. Yes, it was the 19th century and which became materialistic and the 20th which became ideological, where intolerance grew. The 18th was ideal. Thank you very much. This is so fascinating. We'll take a short break now here on Matters of Faith and we shall be right back with more on the Enlightenment and the Islamic contribution in a moment. See you then. <laughs> 